the times they are a starting. God damn it. I always wonder how you're going to... What Bob Dylan song is he going to... Uh, what Bob Dylan song are you going to use to battering yeah. ram the door down? I can't just knock. You can't, yeah, you can't <laughs> knock. You have to kick the I hinges. Assume, the world of knowledge has barricaded itself <laughs> from me. And I have to break it in. I have to break in there like the Urukai storming Minas Tirith. <laughs> What? If you bring up Tolkien again, I'm walking, and you can call any one of your friends who live nearby. I, I can't guarantee that he's not in here get, somewhere. Uh, Daniel just pulled out a red pen out and went to page four and crossed something out, just so you know. Mm, change Samwise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, now he's uh, Mikey from the Goonies or whatever. Uh, Rudy. Uh, <laughs> <he's> a, <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Okay. In the mid to late 1800s, LA was in transition. It was trying hard to move away from its Wild West lynch mob loving past that it had settled into since America took oh. over. Over. Party's over. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. These lamos, these wet blankets <laughs> taking over our fun. So the city was reinventing itself into something remotely humane. Yeah. Dare it, I say modern. D- you daren't. A sign of that happening was that newspapers started popping up instead of the town crier who would get shot for telling everyone that the saloon was out of molasses chips mm-hmm. or whatever was happening in this wild west. One by one, little newspapers started to sprout. And one of these was called the Weekly Mirror. Okay. It opened February 1st, 1873 by two guys named Jesse Yarnett and T.J. K-Style, again, still Old West names. And it wasn't so much a newspaper as a pamphlet of advertisements for the printing business that they owned. (laughs) But they called it a newspaper. Now, Yarnell had been a founder of the Evening Press, which was the first paper of this new boom time in L.A., which that started March 27th, 1871. But he left that to start what was the city's only printing business with K-Style. So they were the only ones in town. They wanted to get the word out. So they just print these pamphlets, basically just say, look how good we are. Look at how well printed. stories to tell. um, Look at how well printed this is you yeah. too could be well printed extra extra you can get your extra story at wherever we're located extra with, extra money. we charge extra <laughs> they just called it a newspaper yarnell he would walk around downtown handing this out to anyone that would take it hoping people would see the beautiful printing and hire them to print stuff for them out of their office which is at nine temple street at the corner of new high street on the downey block they were called the mirror printing office and book bindery they had zero interest in newspapers they just were, printing they just like printing yeah enter two more names you've never heard of. There was Nathan Cole Jr. He was the son of a rich guy from St. Louis. And then there was Thomas Gardiner, who is a flamboyant middle-aged Englishman who was walking around dressed in full Victorian clothing in what was still the Old West. Like everyone was in chaps and he's going around dressed like Sweeney Todd. Hipster. (laughs) That's how I imagine he laughed. (laughs) They got shot by some guy. Looks like Yosemite Sam. (laughs) He had also been the editor of the Sacramento Union, which was a legitimate paper up north. So he ended up linking up with Cole, who somehow had no money from his rich dad, but the two knew they wanted to start a newspaper. So they saw one of these issues of the Weekly Mirror and went to Yarnell and Castile, their office, to make a proposition. Yarnell and Castile had the printing facilities and a fake notion of owning a newspaper, and Gardiner and Cole wanted to run a newspaper. So the four men linked up and brought in a fifth guy named S.J. Mathis to become editor, and on December 4th, 1881, the first issue of the Los Angeles Daily Times came out. It was this weird mishmash of people who didn't seem to want the job and all came together to do a job they didn't want to do. Yeah, exactly. And nobody cared about it in the least. No, not at all. It was four pages long. It cost a penny. It was just half block text news articles and half advertisements. That's all it was. And most of the actual articles were just copied and pasted from newspapers on the East Coast. (laughs) Nobody's going to notice. How would you notice back then? That's true. But then how'd they get the paper? I don't know. Someone's noticing. Someone's noticing and someone doesn't care. Lincoln shot again. (laughs) We got to get these delivered quicker. (laughs) This just in. America discovered. <laughs> there was a story about a guy in Philadelphia who threw a bottle of acid into a crowd of people. There was a story about a boat in Newport that ran over a whale. There was a story about a rubber leg that they found in a morgue in Paris. So that was the, those were the sorts of things they were writing I'm about. I'm more surprised that they had rubber. Thus, journalistic integrity was born. <laughs> the paper came out every day except Monday, and they ran out of money within weeks. Okay. They almost went bankrupt immediately. Like every other newspaper right. I've always They were way seen. ahead of their times. <laughs> times. <laughs> They were capable of printing 500 copies an hour, but fish kept getting stuck in the water wheel that they used to run the presses, so they had to keep stopping them. (laughs) My eye just did a thing, like it automatically shut. Welcome to the Old West. Oh my God. Welcome to the transition of America. There's fish everywhere. Welcome. (laughs) Fish was as good as gold back then (laughs) until gold came and it was all about gold. Like your teeth. They're silver. My Um, teeth are made of fish. But aside from that, they just weren't successful. And Mathis hated being the editor, but they decided to double down and keep pushing forward rather than pack it in and cut their losses. I know you hate it, but 
Keep doing it. You I know you have a little but... money. You don't <laughs> need that. But then on July 28th, 1882, just seven long bankrupt months later, a savior stepped in and changed everything. That savior, one of the biggest villains slash heroes this city has ever seen. The Riddler. Harrison Gray Otis. He's the Riddler? He's the Riddler. Oh, oh, I wasn't supposed to say. He was born February 10th, 1837, the youngest of 16 kids on a farm near Marietta, Ohio. Six, it's a farm. You, it's a 16 far- kid. That's a small family. You're, you're giving birth to your employees. So yeah. yeah. If you want to make harvest, you, you got to start gotta, harvesting. Uh, it's harvest You got to start time. producing. <laughs> If you want to make produce, you got to start producing. That's the motto of the Midwest. <laughs> he came from a pretty significant family for America, despite him living on a farm in Ohio, though. His parents, Stephen and Sarah, were actually some of the first pioneers in Ohio. Wow. And Marietta, which is the town they lived in, that was the first settlement in Ohio. That's uh, a big deal. Yeah, for Ohio. Um, <laughs> his grandpa was James Otis, who was the guy who said taxation without representation is tyranny. That was his grandpa. Wow, really? Yeah, it's weird. Wait, this guy is a part of American history, yes. and it's weird that he's not talked about more. Harrison yes. himself, like I said, he was named after his cousin, Harrison Gray Otis, who was a famous senator whose main job was to confuse a lot of my research. <laughs> but our Harrison, I'm going to call him Harrison okay. to make things easier. HGO? HGO. <laughs> Double A, HGO. HGO. So he grew up working on the family farm and going to school during the winter when there was no farming to be done. But all this only amounted to three years of country schooling. I understand what that is. Yeah. He learned how to whittle for a year. (laughs) And then the year after that, he learned how to spit. (laughs) (laughs) That didn't really matter because at age 14, he took a job as a printer's apprentice at the local newspaper, the Noble County Courier, which he did. He worked there for years. During this time, in 1856, he decided to give higher education a try and enrolled at the Weatherby's Academy in Lowell. But the only subject that interested him was his teacher, Eliza. Lisa Weatherby, who also happened to be the daughter of the school's founder, not Flounder, not the kind that got stuck in there. Lowell, Massachusetts. I, I couldn't. There were different Lowells. Okay. I wasn't sure which one it that's was. That's where Kerouac's from. That's, oh, no. That's not that one. It. She was three and a half years older than him, but they fell in love. He called her Lizzie, and to make things more confusing, like I said, she called him Harry. Oh, God. <laughs> the two got married on September 11th. There's the date again, 1859, and moved to Louisville, Kentucky, because Harrison got a better job working at the Louisville Journal. They eventually had five kids with only three of their daughters surviving Mabel, Lillian, and Marion. You're going to be getting to, I think. A little bit. Huh. I guess women don't matter in this story. I know I said that at the beginning, but you're the one. You're living it. Listen, when we get to buff, I'll take, uh, you know, I'll give you your ladies, okay? Buff? We'll get there. You're just flexing at me. I flexed on a Flex flu. alert and you start <laughs> moving your pectorals. Back in 1857, he had given education another stab at Granger's Commercial College in Columbus, Columbus, Massachusetts. <laughs> where Kerouac's from. And again, <laughs> that's where Herman Hess is from. <laughs> and again in 1861, he took a, about another year's worth of college before he decided that he actually just liked working in newspapers. Yeah. Why go to college? Here, but here. not more than he actually really liked being involved in politics. Harrison was a pretty liberal guy at the time, which is shocking when you hear yeah. what he has to say what I have to say in about 15 minutes. His dad helped shelter fleeing slaves on the Underground Railroad on their farm in Ohio on their way north. So that value system was passed on to Harrison and led him to join the Republican Party down in Kentucky when they were the good people. Yeah. He was actually made one of the delegates to the Republican National Convention in 1860 where he helped nominate Abraham Lincoln to run for president. <laughs> I'm telling you, this guy is a part of American history. It's weird. But in doing so, he also saw that a civil war was brewing and he was deep in the South and wasn't he was an to that. So before that could start, he fled back north to Ohio, Ohio to be Ohio, Ohio. Oh, hello. To be part of the Union. And on June 12th, 1861, he enlisted as a private in the 12th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry to fight the rebels. Those pesky rebels and their love of the color gray and the color white. <laughs> Can we have white uniforms? I mean, it's pretty on the nose, but still. <laughs> in his four years in the army, he fought in 15 battles, was wounded at Kernstown and Antietam, which was the bloodiest day of the Civil War. Jesus. He served under few future assassinated President William McKinley and was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel by none other than not assassinated future President Rutherford B. Hayes, which is why from then on he insisted on being referred to as the Colonel, much to the annoyance of Mr. Sanders. After barely surviving the war with honors, he returned home to Murrieta, where he got a job as the publisher for the Washington County News for the next 18 months before he was finally able to combine his two passions of kind of being interested in newspapers and really liking politics. In 1866, when he was elected as the official reporter of the House in the Ohio Legislature, legislature. At this point, he was able to pull all the strings he had grabbed a hold of during his time in the Civil War, which if you didn't die, seemed to be a great networking opportunity. <laughs> I got a plan. I got, I'm going to kill and my I'll, own brother. Uh, and I'll get a job. This I won't is, die this and is I'll my five-year plan. <laughs> in 1867, he moved to Washington, D.C. for several different reasons. He was made second lieutenant 
lieutenant general in the regular army. I don't understand military rankings at all. Yeah. He got a job in the government printing office, became the DC correspondent for the Ohio State Journal, and also the managing editor of the Grand Army Journal, which was the first newspaper for Union soldiers post-war. Oh, cool. Okay. I he, won. Here's what to do now. <laughs> Did we really win? That was the first issue. <laughs> Remember that time I fired one bullet and it took 18 minutes to load another bullet? Yeah. Death sounded brutal back then. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand how, like, do cannons explode? I don't get it. Like, do they just, so they just, like, barrel into everything? I'm pretty sure. It's but what a are the odds? Cannon. It's, I feel like the force of it is more powerful than the heat of it. But a cannon's if it hits small. You, you'll burn. <laughs> Your bruised and dead body will burn. <laughs> you don't want that. But I don't understand, like, because a cannon's a small thing. Like, unless yeah. you're lined up, 10 people well, in a line, I don't understand. Or whether they think, hit the ground and it would, but there's also dirt would fly on you. formations, too. Like, yeah. they, they had a lot of formations, so you just shoot it into but a if, crowd of people and you know, disperse. But if it's like, a, even if it is a line of 10 people, the first five people get hit by the cannon, and you'll be like, oh, a cannon's coming. Better get out of the yeah. way. Or it'll slow down. I don't know. Well, I mean, how far or is it? it goes it? through your stomach. It could go through your stomach. Yeah, old warfare is dumb. They should have... Native sh- Americans and their bows and arrows were pretty on point. Yeah, you did- literally. There's your wordplay. You're good at this. You know, I went to college once. <laughs> it's a long time ago. And I then I young. dropped out to start a newspaper. So during this time in D.C., he also became a delegate at the convention that nominated Ulysses S. Grant for president. Oh. So he he nominated two of like the major presidents. That's insane. From here, he worked his way into the patent office in 1871. But by 1874, he and his wife were growing tired of the old crowded oh. East Coast and longed for a new way of life. Fate sh- sure. <laughs> I've got a new invention. Uh, <laughs> it's called booging. <laughs> I had a vision when I was watching Atlanta burn. <laughs> I thought if only there was water to put this out and I, I could ride the water. I pulled a young boy out of the wheat fields and he was severed in half and he had dying words for me and he said, Cowabunga. <laughs> <laughs> so fate shined upon them when they saw an ad in a newspaper to move to California to raise goats. So they immediately took a trip out there and they didn't like the goats. But Harrison <laughs> fell in love with... Ca- I love goats. Again, you're putting animals down a lot this episode. I, I don't like it. <laughs> oh boy. They fell in love with California. They really liked it. Okay. More so than the natural beauty and lifestyle, he fell in love with the financial opportunity in California. It's beautiful. You can see the checkbooks for miles. <laughs> On a clear day, you can see my bank account. I can exploit all of these people. Look at all these <laughs> All these friendly, rubish people. When he came to visit LA that year, the city was, for lack of a better term, still a sleepy Pueblo town. Mm -hmm. But he said, it more than fulfills my expectations. It is the fattest land I ever was in. And from the pictures I've seen of him, he's one to talk. Uh, That he could fit in it (laughs) is telling. It took a couple more years, but in February 1876, he finally had his life in order enough to finally move out west to the City of Angels, Santa Barbara, Uh, where he was able to take over the Santa Barbara press. I imagine at the time there was just a mission that was no longer in operation and Harrison... (laughs) And an art gallery. An art yeah. gallery. Oh, yeah. An art gallery. Maybe a craft brewery. A few homeless people. And Harrison Gray Otis. And Harrison Gray Otis. Sitting there on a rocking chair. He saw Santa Barbara as having potential to become the metropolis in Southern California. And if he had held... You stupid if idiot. He had, <laughs> in high, you should have had hindsight. <laughs> if he had held on to that belief, it might have been. But he lost yeah. interest in the city pretty quickly. He wasn't as, making... As we all do. <laughs> I mean, it's good for like an afternoon. <laughs> he wasn't making enough money from the newspaper and he still had hopes of a political career. So he had decided to get on the fast track to political power and fortune and accepted a job as the U.S. Treasury agent in the Seal Islands in Alaska. Oh, he made, wrong direction, he made dude. Ten, go north, young man. He made $10 a day and was in charge of keeping away poachers and making sure the local Inuits didn't drink alcohol. That was his job that the government gave him. Putting soda into beer cans. Here, ah. try some of my beer. <laughs> it's all the sodas in one. He knew the essence of the city. He got it. If the Seal Islands could be a drink, it would be Mountain Dew. He hated this. Yeah. He hated being there, but he sent all his money back to Lizzie so they could afford to start a new life away from Santa Barbara. Yeah. And she went hat shopping with it. Uh, so when he felt he had... You already have hats. <laughs> we don't need hats in the sun. <laughs> so when he felt he had enough money, he came back to Santa Barbara and saw that over in Los Angeles, there was a newspaper that was eight months old and failing and it was up for sale, the Los Angeles Daily Times. This was just the opportunity he was looking for. Mathis, the editor who hated being there, yeah. and a silent partner named A.W. Francisco learned that Harrison was interested so they courted him to get him to come in and take over the paper from them but the rest of the partners didn't 
want him, but they didn't really have a choice because yeah. none of them had money. None of them, not even Harrison, Gr- like no, no, nobody, 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 involved, in, the, nobody, nobody in the equation had money. <laughs> Everyone here wanted money, and none of them had it. That's so funny. So and those are people who want money the most. <laughs> at this time, he got offered another meaningless government job as the consul for the Samoan Islands, which could have given him more money, but he had to act now. So he yeah. sold the Santa Barbara Press and was able to raise the five thousand dollars for a quarter share in the paper on July twenty eighth, eighteen eighty two. And in October, he and his family moved to L.A. Finally, the guy who replaced Harrison as the editor of the Santa Barbara Press six months later, he published an editorial criticizing a local candidate for the DA office, and he was shot dead in the street by that candidate. It was a brewery, (laughs) an art gallery, the old mission, a few homeless people, and one murderer. (laughs) So now Harrison was the new editor of the Los Angeles Daily Times, and he and his wife, Eliza, did almost literally everything for the paper. He would write the editorials, local news, find the clippings from other papers to publish as their articles. He was also able to buy for some telegraphic news when they could afford it. She would write articles on literature, women's life, morals, and religion. She had columns called The Saunterer and Man. Susan Sunshine, and she would even publish her own poetry in the newspaper. An early issue had a poem of hers that I think should be the Pledge of Allegiance that we sing at the beginning of each of our episodes. Okay, let's hear it. Oh, you darling pansies, with your meek little faces and your airy fairy graces filling the garden's quiet places. <laughs> I think it's very fitting. It's very fitting. It sounds like it could be very pleasant in another era, but now it's all put down words. I think about that so many times. Like how many words have just flipped their flipped, meaning. Entirely flipped. <laughs> in the worst possible way. What was once poetry is now hate crimes. <laughs> it's just hate speech. The both of them were also cleaning the place and doing all the day-to-day Jeez. things. And Harrison made $15 a week doing this, but they were still a very small operation. Yeah. Then in late 1883, one of the original founders, K Style, he died. So Harrison saw this power vacuum as a real opportunity. So he brought in another Dude, He saw he saw this death and thought, how do I he, how can I squeeze some he, opportunity out of this? He's the guy who came to LA and saw the beauty of the financial potential. So obviously, obviously. Uh, that's how he thought. What does this death mean for me? <laughs> What'd you do for me lately? <laughs> so he brought in another colonel, his rich friend who wanted to be a publisher, H.H. H. Boyce. He was also a c- former colonel. Together with Boyce, the two of them bought out the rest of the partners and forced them all out of the company, which I'm sure they were not sad about at all. Yeah, no. Please buy me out. <laughs> yeah. So now Boyce and Harrison were the co-owners of the paper. Their next move was to gather up the sister paper of the Daily Times, which was the Mirror. So they incorporated the Times and the Mirror in October 1884 as the Times Mirror Company, which it never made sense to me why their old headquarters was called the Times Mirror Complex. Yeah. That's why it was the LA okay. Times and the Mirror. So those were the two original papers. The Mirror would slowly fade away as it drifted into just being printed once a week as part of the Daily Times. So it just kind of went it away. It fizzled away. It fizzled away. It comes back later, but minorly. Are you fact checking me? Actually, I hate to do this to you, but... You better fact check yourself. I'm itchy. <laughs> fact check yourself before you fact wreck yourself. This was when they decided decided to revamp the paper and make it into something with a little more appeal. To start, all nudity. It's Playboy. (laughs) I know we don't have pictures yet, but how can we make a centerfold? Can we just type a lot of dirty words and they fold it out? What's your mom doing? (laughs) Pansy, pansy, pansy. Pansy, pansy, pansy. To start, they doubled the coverage, expanding it to an eight-page issue. That's what it was now. Double size. Double the pleasure, double the fun. Then they made their headlines catchier, you know, make it a little little more splashy. They added letters to the editor. Sex (laughs) guns. Sex guns and rhythm and blues. <laughs> they added letters to the editor to get people more involved. Mm-hmm. Then in October 1886, they removed the word daily from their name and became the Los Angeles Times. Okay. So now it's officially the Los Angeles it's Times. It's the Los Angeles Times now. Even though it wasn't until the next year that they actually became daily to justify. To justify why it would be called <laughs> daily. It just sounds better. But they needed more writers who could share the workload and cover different stories. This will fill in another guy that we've tiptoed around. The first person Harrison got involved was our old friend, Charles. Charles Fletcher Lummis. I'm like, okay. The man who literally walked to California. Wait till you hear why. Lummis was living in Ohio and became pen pals with Harrison after he got a few issues of the Times in Ohio. And he liked the paper so much that he asked Harrison for a job writing it. And Harrison agreed. That's why Lummis walked. You are kidding. No, he wa- that's why he walked 3,705 miles from Ohio to LA, the longest commute in history. That is ridiculous. <laughs> for a job. How many times have we heard stories about like, he came here for a job and the job wasn't there. That's when they had cars and plane and he walked here? This wasn't just some quirky thing. He agreed that along the way he'd send in letters that he would write like on his journey. This was all a publicity thing. Yes, exactly. It was a travel correspondence. So he was mailing them in along the way of his adventures and oh, they would publish okay. them in the Times to get more people interested. On the road. 
Uh, he's Jack uh, Kerouac. <laughs> he's Herman Hess. <laughs> he's Siddhartha. By the time he showed up at the San Gabriel mission on February 1st, 1885, after the 143 day journey, he showed up with a broken arm. He was already a local celebrity from oh, his things. Okay. That, this was all their plan. It was all publicity. Okay. That's pretty it's cool. St- it's still cool. cool. I like that. I yeah. would love to read that. It's a lot It's a lot better story than what I thought before was like, he just couldn't get I'll a be ride. There in I'll be there in half a year. Yeah, half a year. <laughs> Harrison met him at the mission that night. And that slave labor camp in San Gabriel? Let's meet over there. <laughs> That's the one. Meet you by the whipping post. <laughs> they walked the last 11 miles into the city together, arriving at 11 p.m., and Lummis started work at 10 a.m. the next morning. Oh, my God. Not even a day nope. off. He became the first city editor. So that's uh, that's his story. The first reporter they hired, who wasn't Harrison or Eliza or Lummis or anyone in their family, was a man named Harry Ellington Brook in 1886, an editorial writer who was actually the guy who started Land of Sunshine magazine that oh, okay. Lummis later took over. Okay. What's his name? Brook? Uh, Mel Brooks. Yeah, Mel Brooks. That's the one. Harry Ellington Brook. Okay. Another Harry, by the way. Yeah, like we need another one. <laughs> All full, thank and you. And this guy, uh, he's Harry. He went by the nickname Otis, though. <laughs> they added William Spaulding as a telegraph editor and general assistant, a cabinet maker from Bavaria, which is a position at the time. <laughs> the official political position. <laughs> You're the cabinet maker of the cabinet? <laughs> this guy was named Frank X. Foffinger, and he became their bookkeeper, and he stayed for 50 years. Wow. So now they had a little team. However, Harrison and Boyce had a falling out in March 1886 and Boyce said he'd agree to be bought out for $27,000, which he knew Harrison didn't have. What he didn't know is that Harrison was deeply spiteful and very well connected. So he borrowed the money from several friends and got all of that money and kicked him to the curb wow. and made himself president, general manager, and editor-in-chief. He was in charge now. Boyce, then out of spite, started the Tribune to try to put the Times out of business. Really? Yeah. Problem was, they didn't go out of business. <laughs> <laughs> they just kept growing. In 1892, they added photography to the paper and the late 1890s, they added comics to the paper. They were becoming more and more appealing and their circulation kept growing and they raked in a lot of advertising money because they were ruthless in getting advertisers. What they would do is they would print articles putting down something like a real estate company and then send a letter to that company saying, well, stop printing these articles if you take ads out in our in our paper. And it worked. Oh my. Most of the ads seem to be for erection pills, though. I'm not joking. I'll get to the name of one of them later. Like most of them are veiled like... Mm. Are you a little tired sometimes? Like it's, oh, okay. it's like veiled things. Like we know what these are. Just say it. Yeah, just say it. <laughs> this is Playboy. Just Does say a life it. living in mud not make you horny? Which meant something else. <laughs> are you a horny little pansy? <laughs> Which was a greeting back then. <laughs> so yeah, it was mostly erection pills and also an app to easily pick up food around town. That's what they were advertising. It uh, was called Trident Spot. <laughs> they became successful enough to move out of their fish clogging old headquarters into a dedicated new building that Harrison liked to call the Fortress. It was at the corner of First and Broadway, which was then Fort Street actually and was the first granite building in the city. The granite came from the mountains behind Monrovia. Oh, okay. um, from the mines of Moria. There's your Lord of the Rings <laughs> reference. You You're said welcome. you crossed it out. Uh, no, I got the Samwise one. I, I missed miss this one. It was three stories tall and it cost $50,000. It looked like a castle and had all yeah. these bells and whistles on it. Not literally, though. Castles don't have that. This is what blows up? This is yeah, the this building. is the one that blows up. I've only known it as rubble. I've only seen the after picture. <laughs> it, it had a copy shoot between the business offices and editorial rooms. Yeah. It had a new steam engine press. They had new fonts they could use. Each department could communicate with each other through speaking tubes. Later <laughs> called phones. Later called throats. <laughs> it even had a front counter. We, I know we talked about this yeah. in the bombing episode. It had a front counter supposedly made out of wood from both Union and Confederate ships. The California Missions and Lincoln's deathbed. I nominated him. I get a piece of his deathbed. <laughs> we have a pen holder. It's actually Jesse James' skull. <laughs> Everything was made out of someone else's misfortune. <laughs> it said on the front of the building all the news all the time and it also had the emblem of Harrison's motto stand fast stand firm stand sure stand true that's the motto of Cobra Kai isn't it (laughs) wax on wax off was the motto of the Tribune (laughs) (laughs) it's wax like getting hit wordplay (laughs) everybody likes wordplay right it opened July 1st 1887 but it wasn't until 1891 that the iconic Iron Eagle was put on top of it which also took on another meeting (laughs) a few years later also an 80s movie (laughs) but as much as we can talk about what the paper itself did, we have to talk about Harrison's personality because he had so much control over the paper, over the peop- the paper, also the people, over yeah. the paper, that who he was manifested it in newspaper form through the times. Yeah. You were getting Harrison Gray Otis delivered at your doorstep every morning. Oh That's what you God, were getting. That is so weird. Yeah. Most of this part of my story is best expressed through quotes people had about Harrison. Mm-hmm. Anything that 
is disgraceful, depraved, corrupt, crooked, and putrescent, that is Harrison Gray Otis. He was a large, aggressive man with a walrus mustache, a goatee, and a warlike demeanor. The military bee buzzed incessantly in his bonnet. He was a holy terror in his newspaper plant. His natural voice was that of a game warden roaring at seal poachers. He was politically ambitious all his life. Though he never ran for an office, he asked for many. <laughs> That's pretty scathing. Yeah. He was described as a bully and a buffoon with the temper of a hungry tiger, and that he approached life as if it were the Civil War battlefield of Antietam. As well, lo- funny you yeah. should mention that. <laughs> funny you should mention that. I keep reading all these things like, you know he had nah. like, PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sufferer. I have a little a mercy. Veteran and a sufferer. As Loomis put it, he hated anybody who was afraid of him. He used the powers that came with running a newspaper ruthlessly. To start, he would constantly publish takedowns of the other papers in town to discredit them and the promote the battle? times. Yeah. <laughs> he had beef. <laughs> yeah, a lot of beef. A lot of beef. Which helped them make a name for himself. Like that's okay. that really worked for them. But through his editorials, he set the tone and leaning of the times, which was right wing, conservative, racist. Yeah. That was what they were all about. To him, progressives weren't called progressives. Again, this is where he kind of like somewhere along the line, he, he flipped. He, he flipped. He got away from like Abraham Lincoln should be president. Yeah. My dad helped free slaves. I hate all people who aren't white. Like that, I don't know what happened. And money. <laughs> Again, I don't know if he I don't know if he hated, you know. I think that but I, he was racist. He There's was, no denying yeah, it. Yeah, no, I, he re- was I read racist. stuff. Yeah. Uh, to him, progressives weren't called progressives. They were socialist freaks. Yep. He called labor leaders corpse defacers, and he called one governor a born mob leader. <laughs> Which, by the way, there's a lot of parallels yeah. to the current uh guy who's in charge right now. Yeah. Has he not called someone a born mob leader? Yeah. Like I feel like he's said that exact thing. The progressives are still being called socialists exactly. or whatever. Reading this, at some point I came up with a similar like, oh my god, that that's just I'll a tale that. as old as time. <laughs> Other enemies of his were called scoundrels, un-American, assassin-like, cowardly, and anarchic scum. And he had many enemies. He had a lot of people to call this. In the 1884 presidential election, he wanted James G. Blaine to win. But when Grover Cleveland won, he printed stories for 11 days saying Blaine won. What did you do before you had Twitter? That's what you did. Exactly. You got a newspaper. You got a newspaper and you just published. Uh, late edition. Everyone uh, wake up. I'm way better. He once sabotaged a guy who he didn't want to be California Secretary of State by printing an article saying that this guy was in an orgy such as even the most salacious pen in ancient Rome never dared describe in a scene of absolutely sickening bestiality. <laughs> this really is Playboy. And <laughs> someone say sickening bestiality? <laughs> a progressive governor of California that Harrison hated said of him, the guy said this about Harrison, that he had gangrened heart and rotting brain, grimacing Whoa. at every reform, chattering impotently at the things with senile dementia. That's metal. That's granite. His paper often distorted the facts to fit Harrison's agenda. Would you call it and fake and news? <laughs> he was sued for libel repeatedly. He just used that as more fuel for the yeah. fire. Here's what he had to say about Los Angeles. Los Angeles wants no dudes. <laughs> No fat chicks. Los Angeles wants no dudes, loafers, and paupers. People who have no means and trust to luck. No cheap politicians, failures, bummers. (laughs) No scrubs. I'm I'm not joking. He said no scrubs. Impecunious clerks. Bookkeepers, lawyers. Bookkeepers. He already hired one from Bavaria. Doctors. He said no more doctors. He said the market is overstocked already. We need workers, hustlers, men of brains, brawn, and guts. Men who have a little capital and a good deal of energy. First class men. That being said, he hated the working man. (laughs) He despised the working man. You know what I hate about doctors is that I can't exploit them the way I can with just some kid who walked in. How does a person go through the Civil War and see all that death and then be like, doctors are foes? Money. Or like, uh, uh, like money? there's too money. <laughs> I feel like at, at some point somebody killed the real Harrison Gray Otis and like, <laughs> I can grow a mustache they and killed, be fat. They killed the real Harrison Gray Otis and William Mulholland filled in <laughs> As we know, he was very anti-union. Yeah, as uh, we know. The International Typographers Union called his times the most notorious, most persistent, and most unfair enemy of trade unionism on the North American continent. <laughs> Which is weird because Harrison actually had been a member of that very union in the 1860s. Something just flipped in him. Yeah. He even quit a paper back then because they wouldn't let him join the union back in his old in days. In his old days. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe he was killed. It's the Manchurian candidate. Yeah. Like something, <laughs> something weird happened. Now he was printing op 
op-eds regularly saying how bad unions are, the banner of the paper even said on it, true industrial freedom. When the real estate bubble burst in 1887 and the economy crashed, the Times cut back to four pages an issue and he lowered his workers' wages. So they striked. So Harrison yeah. got a bunch of scabs and actually increased his circulation oh. without his regular workers, Jeez. which caused the strikers to take the strike on a national level and yeah. asked advertisers around the country to stop working with the Times. But the strike kind of dissipated. I did not understand this story. They ran an ad for Mormon bishop pills, which were erection pills, and a bunch of women signed a boycott against it. And I guess people found that to be so funny that they just gave up on the strike and went back to work. I, I didn't don't understand. I didn't understand. I, I didn't understand the story, but that's what happened. It just became a joke that like women would get involved and uh -huh. erection pills were what they were fighting over, and that shamed the strikers to stop. They were like, "Ah, oh, you're right. You're right. We don't Let's mean all, anything. Let them eat boners." Yeah. <laughs> But the real pinnacle of the anti-union fight happened on October 1st, 1910, mm -hmm. when the McNamara brothers blew up the LA Times building. You can hear the full story on our episode, the podcast that time forgot. 21 people were killed in the bombing, showing once and for all that fake news and wrongly influencing people has consequences, and no one ever took advantage of that again. The building was destroyed, and the yep. second building was open on the two-year anniversary of the bombing on October 1st, 1912, at the same location. It was ready, but they wouldn't want to let people in until the anniversary. This will be dramatic. <laughs> Charlie Chaplin actually filmed his first movie making a living in that building in really? 1914. The uh, new building. Yeah. The, well, it's their third overall. Yeah. While it was being built, they were headquartered at 531 South Spring Street. His home life was also ridiculous. Harrison had a weird home life. His house was at 2401 Wilshire Boulevard, right on MacArthur Park. It was one of the first homes built on the new Wilshire Boulevard, and he called it the Bivouac, which is a military term for a temporary camp with no tents. Of course, he was obsessed with weapons. So he had guns hanging from the ceiling of the house like a hillbilly mobile. <laughs> it's really weird. There's just like shotguns hanging from the ceiling. Yeah. He even kept shotguns in the newsroom at work in case there was a labor uprising. Well, I could, like it's funny because it seems but wacky, fool but me also, once. fool me once. <laughs> it's not unjustified, it's not but un hey, you, you it's did a, this. It's an it's a intense reaction to yeah. that. <laughs> he drove a car that was custom built to make the horn on the front look like a cannon. I've been putting gas in the wrong one. <laughs> to get the horn to work, you have to put a bunch of gunpowder in there. <laughs> the McNamara's also had planted a bomb at the bivouac, but it was found and diffused before it went off. To spite them, though, he built a replica of the fortress that was about as big as a guest house on his front lawn made out of the rubble of the blown up building Whoa. just to spite them. Three years after the bombing, somebody even sent a ticking stick of dynamite through the mail to the bivouac, but... Um Come on, try a little harder. Listen, we all saw Looney Tunes when we were kids. Doesn't mean you have to replicate it. <laughs> Special delivery. Must be a clock. <laughs> he took his military career very seriously. He already called his office the fortress. His home was the bivouac. He called himself the colonel. He also called his staff the phalanx, which is another military term. Also a term for erection pills. His business cards just had a picture of him in his military uniform and a list of all his military ranks. Call me. Call me, <laughs> colonel. Call me. <laughs> he was 61 years old when the Spanish-American War broke out mm -hmm. in 18. 98, which he had pushed for in the Times. And he asked his old friend, President McKinley, to appoint him Assistant Secretary of War, but the Secretary of War didn't want him because he was too conservative. He instead enlisted with the United States Volunteers and was made a Brigadier General. But by the time he got to the Philippines, the war was over, but he stayed to put down the Filipino insurrection that became known as the Philippine-American War. He commanded 3,300 men, and he was good at it. Wow. Like, all this boastfulness it, actually it has got a place. the job done. When he got home, he promoted his everyday nickname, Rank, and from then on, he insisted on being called the general. For the best newspaper slander in town, <laughs> unfortunately, not long after he got home from war, Eliza died and he poured himself into the times. That yeah. was that was all he had. Now, for as inflammatory and horrible as he was, he also made huge positive impacts on the city. Even though he wanted everyone to be white, yeah. he was still a huge booster of the city and he used the times to push that agenda. He told people in it how great the city was and how bright and white the future was. Uh, Real bright. <laughs> like, reflect Reflectively bright. Eliza wrote poems when she was alive about how great it was to live in LA. On January 1st, 1885, they did their first midwinter edition, which was basically a tourism ad for LA showing how good the weather was in the winter. And they got this shipped into cold cities all over the country to make people like, oh yeah. God, I got to move. And yeah, this combined move. with the low Southern Pacific and Santa Fe railroad fees at the time, it was no coincidence that during Harrison's tenure at the helm of the times, the city's population grew from 12,000 when he started to over 500,000. He created 
created the Chamber of Commerce in 1888. He tipped the scales away from the new port of LA being built in Santa Monica and into San Pedro with if Southern Pacific had gotten their way and it was built in Santa Monica with only Southern Pacific trains having access to it, the city would never have become home of the busiest port in the country. That yeah. would not have happened without him. Harrison, as weird as this sound, he wanted the port to be free access to mm -hmm. everybody. In typical Harrison fashion, he wrote about Collis P. Huntington and Southern Pacific on the issue. He said, he said to me, he said, is this a community of independent American citizens or one we vassals of a bandit who has neither bowels of compassion, common decency, nor an organ in his putrid carcass so great as his gall? Wow. I love these insults. Of course, we know he helped get the aqueduct built by using the times to scare the city into believing they needed an aqueduct immediately. Yeah. But again, the valley wouldn't have become what it is without this aqueduct. Because of his political connections in D.C. and now the Times, Harrison was without a doubt the most powerful person in Los Angeles. He was called the single most important force in Los Angeles aside from the government itself. Wow. And he used that power to turn the Times into a political force. It's been said that no American newspaper has dominated a city the way the Los Angeles Times has dominated Los Angeles. They say it over and over again, but it is true. The LA Times invented LA as we know it. They brought the population, they brought the water, they brought the commerce from the port, and this was all Harrison's doing. Yeah. Like, he spearheaded this. Between him and the guys you're about to talk about and their wives, they are probably the most important family in LA history. They are. They are. Definitely. Uh, I know I said probably, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> By 1914, he was getting a little too old for the game, so he gave controlling interest in the paper to his daughter and her husband, who you're going to talk about. But he still managed the day-to-day -day stuff until the day he died, which was July 30th, 1970, at age 80. He died in bed after eating breakfast. His last words were to his maid, who was serving breakfast. He said, take the tray away. I am gone. Oh, and the cause of death, a rupture of the heart. Broken heart. What becomes of the, the ruptured hearted? Heart. Buried. His funeral was at the First <laughs> Congregational Church, not far from his house. He's at Hollywood forever now, if you oh. want to say hi. During his last day, he got uncharacteristically charitable, though. He had a Darth Vader uh, <laughs> reversal at the end. He became obsessed with calling for an alliance of nations to end all global conflicts. And this was before World War One even ended. And wow. they did that sort of thing, yeah. which didn't work. But still, he also <laughs> will allow one more. <laughs> he also never showed an interest in art during his life. But when he died, he left the bivouac to L.A. County to be used continuously and perpetually for the arts and advancement of the arts. This became the Otis Institute. Oh, OK. Harrison Gray, Otis. Otis. In wow. 1918, which was the first public independent professional school of art in Southern California, it stayed, it was his house yeah. until 1997. A statue of him was put up in MacArthur Park in 1920. It was paid for by his rich friends like Henry Huntington and it was made by Paul Trubitskoy, who was a Russian prince. And the statue was of a newsboy looking one way and a soldier pointing down Wilshire looking the other way. It's now in a different spot in the park, so it's not quite pointing down Wilshire anymore. And in 1996, there was a third part of the sculpture, which was a younger soldier that went missing and no one can ever find it. 